All right, so we were in, we were at 10 degrees, 7 degrees last night. It's in the teens Fahrenheit today. I wanted to show you the difference between a greenhouse and a cold frame. So there's been snow on this cold frame for three days now, maybe four days. It requires maintenance. I can either leave the snow on and give it insulation, so in the teens it probably would love some ins insulation, but it can't get any sunlight. So when people show me or talk about cold frames, this is pretty much what they're talking about. If you have um, a box built with the glass on top, that's still a cold frame. It still has to be brushed off. On really bright days, it needs to be maybe vented. These are high maintenance. Doesn't mean they're bad. They're just high maintenance. And if it's snowing or blustery, you're out in the nasty weather at the same time. This one, the snow slides off on its own. And um, you don't, you know, you can go out and you can like bump it a little bit if there's a lot of snow and then the snow will come off on its own. But I can be in there in really cold weather and still garden. See the green? There's a little bit of green. In this kind of weather, I have to be careful that my camera doesn't freeze because then it turns off and I'm not aware that it turns off. So I'm gonna do my best. I did add strings to the edges. This is what holds the door open. All right, it is warm in here, probably in the 50s or 60s. I had the tree guy call me two days ago and he's like, hey, we got a full load. Do you still want it? Yes. So we have new sawdust, which is such a blessing. I'm going to come and fill everything in until it's up to these lathe. You can see I've got some small texture and I've got some big texture. The hotbed doesn't care. If you guys feel confused about the process that I'm showing you, I do have a little PDF on my Etsy store. It's like $3, it's not very expensive, and it just takes you through the basics. There's not really a wrong way to do a hotbed. It's carbon, mostly carbon. It can be giant logs. It's pretty much just a hugel culture inside a pallet frame. Because this is an older, already used, more established bed, it's not gonna sink that much. If this was a brand new bed that I had just put a whole bunch of leafy branches into and a whole bunch of big piles of wood, it would have a significant amount of collapsing to do around all the big objects. Not because it was heating up and breaking down quickly, but because as I'm getting it wet, it's gonna settle physically instead of chemically doing anything. Because you have a lot of air pockets that need to settle. So, if this was a new bed, I would be um, 
I would be like mounding it and then watering it. But as it is, I'm just gonna fill it up to the top of the lathe and then let it water it in and let it settle for a couple days and then add a little bit more. Now, where it does the most settling is in the corners and on the edges. The inside of the bed is gonna stay moist and it's gonna kind of collapse in on itself because in the middle of the bed is where all your heating happen happens. Bacteria is super happy in the middle of the bed. So what happens is as the middle kind of collapses in on itself and starts to degrade, these outside bits next to the walls are gonna collapse into that. And then as it collapses, a lot of times what I'll do is just go get some more sawdust and pour it into the crack. Okay, so one of the books that I learned how to do this with is called Stand Up and Garden by Mary Moss Sprague. And she used straw instead of wood chips. Now the problem in my opinion with straw is that it's sprayed so much now that it kills the good bacteria and it kills your plants. I have done the straw bale garden and the only time it succeeded was when I put two inches of rabbit manure on the top and um, a buffer of cardboard between the straw and the plants and then I could grow mushrooms, I could grow everything I needed to grow and my opinion is, is that the bacteria in the rabbit manure was able to neutralize some of the um, poison in the straw. So instead of fighting that, what I do instead, and also because it doesn't cost anything, is I use wood waste because it hasn't been sprayed. And I have not found any wood chips that didn't work. In Oklahoma, we used oak and maple and black walnut and all sorts of wood, uh, all sorts of mixed wood. We used the leaves, we used the branches, we used the sawdust, and it did just as well in Oklahoma with those trees as it does with our softwoods that are piney and sappy. And so this is all evergreen, whereas in Oklahoma it was deciduous. For me, what I do, because it's just the simplest thing, is I bring in a whole bunch of rabbit manure and I spread it on top of the bed and then I water and the rabbit manure starts to dissolve a little bit into the bed. I also have rabbit manure in all the other layers. There's a lot of rabbit manure in here, but I also have goat manure from the goat bedding, and I also have duck and chicken manure from cleaning out the duck and chicken coops. Because this bed heats up to sterilizing point, I'm not worried about having manure in here. Hi. The reason, yes, honey. We're waiting for you. Go ahead and eat without me because I'm right in the middle of this. Okay. Thank you. Love you. Um, the reason that I'm not worried about having manure in the bed next to my food <coughs> is that with the rabbit manure, they are not in contact with anything that they could get parasites from. And all the other bedding is way in the inside of the bed, not in contact with the food. So rabbit manure, we're very, very careful about how we feed our rabbits because of <coughs> the proximity that our rabbit manure is into our food. That being said, do your own research. By the time the roots of the plants get to it, it will have broken down some of this wood mulch. It will also not be so high in nitrogen anymore. The wood mulch and the rabbit manure will have started to kind of meld together a little bit. And by the time the roots get to this, it's pretty much just gonna be soil. So really you're just tap tapping into God's creation and his natural process. You're just speeding it up a little bit by layering it and watering it in. I don't have an exact recipe. I do have um, instructions on the Etsy store on how to build a hotbed and how to mix up your soil, but they're general instructions. If you like it sandier and add more sand. My base is peat moss because it's the least expensive thing I can find in the largest quantities and I get it from Lowe's. 
cheapest of anywheres for me is Lowe's. I get my per light from a local nursery and I think it's $27 for a bag that's almost as tall as I am. And that's my base, perlite and peat moss. I've started to add vermiculite. I don't know if I like it yet. I, in the past, I've added sand and I didn't like it with sand. It was heavier, it cost more. The, the important thing to know about this stuff is that you only need a couple inches of this because what's underneath is breaking down into soil too. So you don't have to use peat moss, you can use coconut core. And I've even done a soil free bed where I just use the wood chips. But I didn't put seeds into that. I put uh, transplants. So if you wanted to do soil free and you wanted to do seeds, you would need to make a space in the sawdust, put a little handful of dirt in, and then put your seed into that because the seeds themselves do need dirt. The reason for that is that the sawdust has too much of an air gap between them. They're not fine enough to protect the roots of the seedlings. You need something that has a fine crumb, I guess, maybe is the word, a fine texture for seedling starting. Otherwise the roots dry out. Unless you're doing something like sprouts, in which case, because you're rinsing them every day, they get enough water, high enough humidity that they'll make it. But that's not vegetable gardening, that's, a, that's sprouts. So there's no, no exact science to this. If you make it stronger, it works stronger. So you could even just fill this up halfway with rabbit manure and then have water in it. This is about a gallon of manure, I would say, and this, I think this is 56 quarts. So, obviously you wanna make sure that your bucket doesn't have a hole in it, because what you're gonna do is you're gonna fill this up with water, and then every time you water into the bed, you're gonna fill it back up. This just turns into a bacteria soup, happy bacteria nitrogen soup. And so you don't have to put more rabbit manure in it, in fact, you don't really want to use this until it's about three days old. It needs to sit, the manure needs to kind of um, disperse into the water and mellow for a bit. The warmer it is, the better, up to a certain point. Um, you don't want it to get hot, but if it's warm, it'll start to turn into some good bacteria. It's like putting yogurt on your bed. It then inoculates your whole bed and it's yogurt. All right, so obviously I'm going to empty out the hose really good. When I do that, when I do that, I run it back and forth and back and forth and back and forth over a high thing. There's the ducks. Um, and then I hang it here. I wanted to show you what it looks like. If I wanted the bed to be hot all the way through with lots of steam, what I would do is make sure that in my bed I had many layers of manure alternating with carbon. If I did that it would get raging hot 
lots of steam and it would shrink by about half. It would break down into compost almost instantly. What I want is a warm bed that doesn't sink very much. So I have mostly carbon with some rabbit manure tea and just the wet sawdust and um, bedding from the goats and the cardboard will break down slowly because they don't have too much bacteria trying to eat them too quickly and they'll just stay warm. It'll just be light bottom heat. <coughs> These ones are jalapenos. 